Welcome back to the Messy Reformation. My name's Jason Rice. I'm the lead pastor at Faith Community CRC in Beaverdam, Wisconsin. My co-host is Willie Cronkey. He's a member at Pease CRC in Pease, Minnesota. We're just a couple of guys who love the Christian Reformed Church and want to see Reformation happen in our denomination. But we realize that whenever Reformation happens in the history of the church, things get messy. And after this past synod, things are continually getting messier and messier in the Christian Reformed Church. So we're taking the opportunity to have conversations with pastors throughout the Christian Reformed Church to find out what's going on in our denomination, but also to talk about what Reformation might look like. If you haven't already, take a moment, click subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. We are dropping episodes every single Sunday evening. We also want to continue to say thanks to everyone who sponsored us on Patreon. We're slowly making our way toward our goal of 20 sponsors at $5 a month. If you appreciate what we're doing and want to help us continue to put out content, head on over to patreon.com slash the messy reformation. You can also support us for free by sharing our content. I'm a terrible self-marketer and need your help. If you know of anyone who would benefit from listening to this content, let them know about the Messy Reformation. With all that said, we're going to get to this week's episode, which is part one of our conversation with Aaron Gonzalez. So Aaron, why don't you kick us off and just tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, and the church that you're at. Okay, well, thanks for having me. Um, I live in Newton, Iowa. It is my hometown, and I am the pastor of the Newton Christian Reformed Church in Newton, Iowa. My wife is from here. We've been married for 27 years. We just celebrated our 27th anniversary on number 30. We have six children, ages, I have to look at notes <laughs> that way. We have six children, ages 20, 14. Five boys, one girl, out of the house. Some are still with us, and uh, yeah. Uh, so Newton is home, and it's where I'm serving, and it's where my family is, and my wife's family is. Very happy to be here. Awesome. Why don't you? Uh, where did you go to seminary? I went to RTS Lando. Okay. Uh, twice. <laughs> you went twice. That sounds like a story. It's a bit of a story. Um, when I was introduced to Reformed theology, it was through, through R.C. Sproul and Ligonier Ministries, and it, it was not directly coinciding with my conversion, but it wasn't all long after it. And one of the things that happened regularly with pastors and other Christians I knew was they came on my mind with theology and for learning and kept telling me, pastor you should go to seminary and um and i was in agreement with it. it became a desire that i had and uh what happened was 96 i really just decided that i wanted to go to seminary and largely because of the connection that at that time anyway a sprawl had with rts or at least had had recently rts got on my radar and I decided that's where I wanted to go uh, to Orlando, and, and so I did. It was a situation where uh, I kind of didn't count the cost, kind of romanticized seminary, and we were just family at that time, and which in our circumstance means we'd been married, and and I just didn't count the cost of everything that was involved, the support that I would have needed. We knew we were going to homeschool. Uh, all of our kids have been homeschooled. We're still homeschooling uh, through high school. And so my wife working so I could go to seminary wasn't an option because she was going to be home with the kids. That's what we both wanted. And working full time and being a seminary student, well, well either visioning. And essentially what happened got down there very, very quickly realized the work. Um, and she would say we. Truth is, I didn't really fully look into everything I should have, and it wasn't long before we were back uh, in Newton, Iowa, uh, me anyway, with my tail between my legs, and uh, that was that was 96, and it wasn't until 2010 
that I was enrolled at RTS Orlando again. And then what was your experience at RTS? Did you enjoy it? Was it really good? It was great. It was great. And I did the distance MDiv program because at the time I was also serving as the pastor here at Newton and in kind of circumstances because I wasn't ordained. And that's another story, I guess. Um, so I go down, most of my classes were done uh, distance, right, through the global campus. But I would go down, once I started doing my residential work, I went twice a year for three years. And those were great experiences. At first, I just, Florida, period. But second of all, just being on that campus and meeting other students, many of whom were in pretty similar situations to what I was in. I always thought that I was probably just an oddball in what I was doing, but uh, there were a lot that were doing kind of the same thing and some from the CRC as well. And uh, the profs were great. Uh, I just had a great time. Everything about it was a good experience. One of my profs came up when I was ordained and preached uh, the sermon at that, at that service. Um, so a lot of great relationships that I still have from there. Awesome. Now you said uh, a, a while ago, you, you mentioned how you kind of came into reformed theology through RC Sproul. Yep. So does that, that some would assume that means you didn't grow up in the CRC, but not, that's not the case. I came to the reformed theology through Piper and RC Sproul in the CRC, but Amen. did you grow up in the CRC or, or did you grow up outside of the CRC? I grew up Lutheran. I was EA the first my teens, you know, college. Um, not that I that really ever. It's just it's where I was. It's where I was confirmed. But um, I would, I wasn't, I wasn't converted. I didn't come to Christ until some years later. But I started in the Lutheran Church when I became a Christian in '92. Um, I started to a Methodist church because I had friends who went to a Methodist church uh, who discipled me uh, after I became a Christian. Uh, that's where I met my wife as well. And uh, and then when she and I, I went to college then and basically finished college after kind of slacking off with no direction in my life. Um, when she graduated high school, she went off to college. I went back to college to finish I ended up transferring to the university she was at because I just wanted to be with her and didn't care where I got my English degree from. And um, while we were there, we uh, joined a Baptist church. So I've been Baptist as well. Uh, I have been uh, Presbyterian for a very short time. Uh, I've been part of a non-denominational church that I, I learned afterwards. I didn't really have this uh, tag to attach to it, but it was in some ways, Anabaptist. And uh, so I've kind of been all over the map. My, my theological pedigree is mutt, uh, but it was, it was a, a Baptist preacher in Cedar Falls, Iowa, who introduced me to Reformed theology, uh, challenged me on some of the things that, that I believe. So he was a Reformed Baptist and started reading some stuff and quickly became convinced of what I was reading, which meant uh, I was becoming unconvinced of a lot of the things I had believed before. And my wife just came to dread hearing, honey, we need to talk. And, but this just kind of marked a period in our lives where I was, um, you know, I was both learning and unlearning. Uh, yeah. so, some stuff was going out, some stuff was coming in and replacing what was going out. And that became a very formative period in my life. This would have been the mid nineties. Uh, when I was really getting cemented in reformed theology. Yeah. Amen. Well, those, those, uh, those are formative periods of our life, but they're also really difficult periods of life. Um, I, I was just talking to somebody about this, uh, this last weekend, I was at a winter retreat classes, Wisconsin, a bunch of the youth groups through the CRC youth groups throughout classes, Wisconsin co-op and, and have a winter retreat every year. And I was one of the speakers at it this weekend. And, I was talking with one of the leaders at that retreat um, just about uh, church revitalization and transitions and all of that. And they talk about in uh, any form of a transition, you're you're leaving something behind and you're moving towards something else. 
And there's this period in the middle they call like the neutral zone where you like you've left things behind, but you still don't quite know where you're going in the future. Kind of, they always, you know, even secular people talk about the wilderness period of the Israelites where they left Egypt behind, but they still haven't entered the promised land and they're kind of wandering in the desert, not really knowing where to go. And those are some of the hardest parts of our lives, right? When you move, that's why moving from like one state to another state is so difficult because you're leaving something behind, but you still don't have roots in that new place. And so you just kind of float there. And like, I remember that even for myself, as I was moving out of my more uh, Baptist-y Armenian roots, which I got from the CRC. But uh, anyways, I, I, I... moving from that into a more like confessional reformed position, there was just this unsettledness. Like, what do I do now? How do I live? How do I live in a world where I believe that God is sovereign over everything, even, even salvation? Like, how do I do that? And, and you just kind of are unsettled for quite a while, but it's really formative because you're unsettled, but now you're wrestling with it. You're going back to God's word over and over and over again, saying, how do I, how do I live in this new reality? Yep. And that, that giving up or leaving or unlearning part can be harder than what's on the other side of it in some ways, you know, as the prophet Yoda said to Luke, you must unlearn what you have learned. And, you know, and, and that can be hard. That can be hard. But, uh, I, uh, I, I've, I've found that to be true that that's, it's, it's a challenge to unlearn. Uh, but you know, if you're replacing it with the right thing, then it's a blessing to unlearn. Yeah. So did you find yourself, I just like to ask, cause I always tell people this, um, like my, my movement from like more Arminian to, to reformed was like Arminian. And then it was like, okay, I'll be reformed because the Bible teaches it, but I really don't like it to eventually growing into a spot where I was like, Oh, I love this. And I find joy and peace and comfort in this. Did you kind of move along that same spectrum as well? Um, a little bit. Yeah, I relate to that, but I don't think that I was, I mean, I wasn't really a hardcore doctrinally convinced Armenian. It was just almost a default position. Mm. It, it had been the air I breathed, probably having been in a Methodist church. And I don't recall them ever, ever having any kind of a conversation of Armenianism versus Calvinism at all. But it's just what I soaked in when I was yeah. there, you know. And so I didn't have a really hard doctrinal position to leave but i still i still would have uh, affirmed the arminian position if in that discussion and that's what happened with this reformed baptist preacher who was a friend of mine too he became a friend and we still are and uh, we he, we were talking in my dorm one day and he i don't even remember how we got talking about this but we were talking about you know god's sovereignty and election and and how all that works and and i said you know i just i just don't believe that and he said really even though the bible teaches it I was like, okay, all right, um, fine. Let's let's talk about this. Let let's do this. And then what what kind of really became a catalyst was there was uh, one of the our Sunday school classes at his church. He asked two students, me and another guy, to present the side the case for uh, either the preservation of the saints or you know, or you can lose your salvation. And I was the lose your salvation side. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I gave my spiel uh, and, and thought I did a fine job of it. And then the other guy spoke and he said, for this conversation, I really need to go back to, you know, he had, he said, I gotta, we have to go back to how we are saved in the first place and God's role in that and his sovereignty in election and in predestination and, and our state before the Holy spirit regenerates us. And he started talking about it's God who saves it's God who does this work. It's, you know, and all that. And the the more he talked, the more I became convinced of his position instead of my own. And so (laughs) honey, we need to talk. So, (laughs) so, so that started it. And his main source in that Sunday school class was RC Sproul. Yeah. So that really kind of uh, set me down that path too, as well as the pastor I'd been talking with. Great. Now, so now how did you end up then in the Christian Reformed Church? Yeah. Um, so one of the churches I did not mention as part of my mutt pedigree is uh, I was at a church in Pella, which is about 25 miles south of Newton. And it was a CR, 
EC church, just to confuse matters. And uh, so I was serving as kind of an associate, kind of an intern. It was a, a little bit of a hybrid role there. Um, having the sense that it would be nice to not drive uh, 25 miles and be in a city that's not our own for church. And I realize in certain contexts, 25 miles is like no big deal to drive that for church. But when you live in kind of rural Iowa and you're really not a part of the community where you're going to church, you start to feel that, or at least we did. And so we already had this growing sense of, you know, maybe this isn't the path that we want to stay on. And I was kind of on a path to ordination in the CREC where the MDiv is not required, but there's still an, a, a rigorous exam that you go through. And it was around that time that a friend of mine called and he was the president of council at Newton CRC and the pastor here was stepping down and they wanted to uh, hire an interim pastor. The last time they did a pastor search, they went four years without a pastor and they didn't want to repeat that. So they wanted some stability, and he asked if I would be interested in putting my name in the hat. Uh, and I was, because largely because of what my wife and I had already been talking about. And so I put my name in, I interviewed, and I think there were three of us, and they, uh, they offered me a year-long interim position here at Newton CRC. About three months into that, the search committee came to the council and said, is there a way to just make this permanent? Can we call Aaron? You know, are there, is there something in place where that can happen? That started a discussion with our classes, Central Plains. And in the end, what that led to, because I was interested in that, what that led to was uh, classes gave me permission that the church ordained me as an elder. Uh, I was licensed to exhort. Classes gave me permission to administer sacraments um, as an elder, providing I pursued candidacy in the CRC. So enter in RTS Orlando, which at the time their flexible schedule worked really well for, for what I was going to have to do over the next several years, being a full-time pastor and doing classwork. And uh, so I started that. I started, I did the EPMC stuff, you know, uh, alongside it towards the end of that process and just plugged away at being a pastor and being a student for those nine years, uh, started in 2010 and graduated in 2019 and, and was made a candidate in 2019 at Synod and was officially called in 2019 as well and installed. Awesome. So, so, so if I just one, one yeah. other thought to that at that CREC church, our, our confessions were the three forms of unity. Yeah. So in the CREC, you, you, every church has, you know, you can you can go with the Westminster standards or you can go with the three forms and our church was three forms. So by the time I got to the CRC, I was already, you know, I was already well established in the three forms of unity. I had been confessing um, and holding to them, subscribing to them for all that time that I was there. So when I got to the CRC, doctrinally, there was no whiplash in, in that sense. You know, culturally, there were some things to learn. Yeah. Well, that was my next question. So good segue, because I was curious, you know, what that was like then move, coming into the CRC, not having kind of grown up into it. What were some of the things that that jumped out at you? I would say things that you thought, wow, this is really great. I didn't think about this and other things that you went, whoa, I never thought that I would encounter this in the Christian Reformed Church. Yeah, um, some of it. Some of it is just, I think, the things that you would expect, you know, just just not having any sense at all, even though I have actually have quite a bit of Dutch heritage, but not in the sense that it ever was a, an issue, a big deal in my life. It was never something, it was just always something that was there like an operating system, but never anything that was right there on the nose in daily living. That was different c coming here and just, you know, that being just a, a reality of, because my previous churches really didn't have that. It was, it was more of a, every church was more of a melting pot. Mm. And this one was, um, you know, not a hundred percent Dutch or anything like that, but vast majority at the time that has changed over the years now. But so just kind of learning those dynamics and, and, you know, how tradition and heritage ties in with the whole, with the CRC experience, 
um, that was a new thing. It wasn't necessarily a hard thing and people were gracious. Um, one thing um, at this church that is the reality is that it, uh, the average span of, of a pastor being here uh, is about four years, um, mm. maybe less. I've never done the exact math, but most of them are three or four years, a couple at six, which might bring the the average up a little bit, but probably not in the grand scheme of things. And so this church has, uh, this is, I'm speaking to another cultural thing about this church. Uh, this church is used to pastors not being around for a terribly long time, but we don't have any interest in being anywhere else right now without getting into why there are a few things that kind of are anchors for us in Newton. And we just anticipate this is where we're going to be. It's where we want to be. Both of our families are here. That's a big part of it. And I'm not saying that God couldn't call me or us to something else, but I, it would be really something if he did, you know, based mm -hmm. on what he's put on our hearts. And um, so over time, kind of a, I don't, I don't want to say it was a distance, but I almost think there was an assumption that, especially given that I was this oddball case, right? I'm not even ordained. I didn't go to Calvin Sam. I've never been in the CRC. This guy's not going to be around very long. And no one said that, but I think it was just there in the background. Mm -hmm. And as time went on and people got to know us better and they kind of knew what we wanted to do, where we wanted to be. And uh, we really dove into, I, I think pastors, I think pastors need to be members of churches as well as being pastors mm -hmm. of churches, right? They need to be yeah. involved. They need to be able to pick up a mop. They need to be able to clean a toilet. They need to be able to go and do these, you know, just be a part of church life, whether they were the pastor or not, just being a part of things. And so we just kind of poured ourselves into the church as well. And um, over time, I think that uh, it changed the relationships that were here. And I'm not saying they were bad. I'm just saying that I think there was this kind of underlying assumption behind all that. And one day uh, coming down, we come down the steps to our foyer from the sanctuary. And the, the old gentleman who was always the first one down came up to me and said, you know what I like about you, Aaron? I said, no, I don't. He said, you're one of us. Mm. And it was like, it was at that moment that I felt like, okay, we've turned a corner here and what the expectations are and in what the relationship is. And at that point, any of those differences, cultural, you know, or whatever expectations, all of that, it just kind of went out the window and it felt like we were really a part of this church, which is as important to me as being known as the pastor of the church. Yeah. Right. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Just as you were talking, I thought of, I thought of two things that, um, you know, there, there's been this tension just in the CRC in general. And, and I remember reading an article, I don't remember how long it, ago it was, but Henry DeMore wrote it. It was maybe like 10 years ago, maybe a little, not quite as long ago, but, but he had wrote an article, like maybe pastors need to hit the road again or something like that saying like, you know, a long time ago, pastors used to be like, in and out, like every seven years they were rotating, going to another church. And about every seven years they thought, Oh, I got to leave, whether it was good or bad, they just got to go. And he was almost trying to promote that happening again, because he noticed this trend of pastors staying longer. And I thought, man, I think uh, I'm noticing the trend, right? Like pastors are staying longer in churches. I Youth pastors, you know, like when I first started in youth ministry, I think the average length of a youth pastor, it was like a year and a half. Right. And now like, I don't see that I'd run into youth pastors all the time that have been in their churches, five, six, seven, eight years. And, and I'm running into more pastors more and more who've been in their church, 10, 11, 12, 15 years. And, and it's kind of this thing that's, that's changing. And uh, I think it's a good thing for me personally. I think there's something that that happens in a church that's different after you've been there um, a long time. I think change, like real lasting change doesn't happen quickly. It happens over a very, very long time. And, and just even the story that you just told, when, you know, when they said like, Aaron, I love you because you're, like, you're one of us. Right. And, uh, and really even deep underneath that is Aaron, We've watched you, we've watched you live, we've done life with you, 
and now we trust you. And that's a huge thing in order for, for to be able to now start leading the congregation because they're like, this guy gets us. He knows who we are. He's been here long enough to see us through the ups and downs. He gets us. We trust him. Now let's let's go together as God's people. So that's um, it's a really cool thing. And I want to keep encouraging people to, to try to do that. It's a really hard thing to stay in a church a long time. And uh, one, one resource I want to just encourage people to listen to and I found it so helpful. And if I ever get really discouraged in ministry, I go listen to this talk. It's a talk by Alistair Begg called The Dangers and Delights of Ministry uh, or Long-Term Ministry or something like that. I don't know. If you if you type in Alistair Begg, Dangers and Delights on YouTube, you will find it. It's like a, it's a talk he gave at his basics conference. And it's phenomenal. And he makes the point, like, just because you stay, you you can be ineffective at a place for a very long time. And that doesn't mean that that's a good thing, you know, but, but he, he goes through some of the just beautiful things that happen when you stay for a long time and, uh, and some of the dangers too, of, of staying for a long time. So I just, I encourage people that I probably have to listen to that once or twice a year, just to kind of remind myself like, yep, here we are. Yep. This is what we're doing. Well, I'll definitely check that out. Alistair Begg is one of my, uh, truth for life is one of my two go-to podcasts when I'm exercising in the morning. So um, I'll, I'll check that out. That would be perfectly consistent with what I do each morning anyway. Yeah. Alistair Begg's great. I uh, love that man. He's grace filled, humble, and just blunt. I, 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 I appreciate him very much. Yep. But his accent makes it okay. So yeah. yeah. Be, be as blunt yeah, as I you want to be. Of these, <laughs> some of these guys, their accent just, uh, I don't know. We, well, eventually we'll be putting out a, an episode that we recorded with David Murray too. And I was like, man, just that Scottish accent makes everything he says sound really profound and really cool. Yeah. And it's so penetrating. Like, I don't have like the Midwest accent, like Minnesota, Iowa accent. It just doesn't have the same thing. It just kind of makes you sound dumb. I suppose. I don't know. That's know, what people just, <laughs> I know every time I listen to him, I just sound so vanilla to me, but yeah. Uh, and Colin Smith is the other one I listen to. <laughs> I don't know if you know who yeah. he is, but similar accent. Yeah, I do. So. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, what are, what are some of the, what are some of the things that you've really appreciated about maybe not just your own church, but like just the Christ being part of the Christian reformed church in general, what are some of the things that you thought, man, this is really good. Well, I mean, the, the theological heritage is, is one for sure, but I've also experienced, um, I, I've really appreciated the relationship between classes and church, and I, I know not everybody has necessarily good experiences, or some maybe, you know, classes is just, you know, a meeting that takes up a weekend that I wish it didn't, you know, a couple of times a year or something like that, but given what happened w- with me, I feel kind of like I've experienced the best of what the relationship between church and classes can be, because we had such support and encouragement from our classes during this whole weird process that was my path to ordination, um, extended path to ordination, right? And uh, um, they they bent over backwards to to put in place something that would work for the church, but still, you know, keep not be a shortcut, but be a, a path that would work and. Uh, would bring about good results for everyone. And so our church always had the support of classes. I always had the support of classes. I always had the support of my church. Mm. And so all of that has just been great, that that whole relationship there. The thing that I've probably become aware of most recently is, so, you know, we have, I, I think of these as concentric circles. Close mm-hmm. and small, tight in is the church. Next one out is classes. And then the denomination in terms of our closeness and yeah. relationships and just, you know, day-to-day ministry and life because of what I did in, in my path to ordination, I had almost all my focus on that inner circle church because I was a full-time pastor and trying to get the classwork done at the same time. There was a little bit of classes focus in that too. Um, but once I, once I graduated and was ordained, now I'm getting more and more into the classical focus, and I'm able to be more a part of that. Now I'm an ordained minister. Now I'm on this committee instead of receiving funds from that committee, right? Yeah. Now, now I'm serving in these ways within classes and, and able to do uh, more of the stuff that was just going on within the life of classes. And, uh, and then 2022 comes around, 
And then the third circle kind of got added, right? Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, I feel like I'm a noob to the denominational circle of that. I, I mean, obviously I'm aware I've been a part of this denomination, but I just didn't have the bandwidth to do much focusing on it because of, of everything else I was going through. Um, I would mark uh, Synod 2022 as that point where all of a sudden that third circle came more mm -hmm. into focus. And um, probably a little less than a month before that, actually, and um, your podcast had a big part to do with that because I was, I was meeting with another pastor in our classes. I looked it up because I couldn't remember when exactly it was. It was May 16, 2022. So I was already a delegate to mm -hmm. Synod. And, and he mentioned to me, you know, there's this podcast out there where the, where the guy has been talking to people who is someone who's been to Synod before and, and going there and, and, you know, told me about the messy reformation. So uh, May 16, I find out about that. And I start listening to your podcast just to kind of learn what to do. And, but then I also start hearing, um, these interviews that you did like mm -hmm. this, which is strange to me that I'm now being interviewed, but, um, through those interviews, I learned a lot of the stuff that's been going on that I just haven't had the bandwidth to pay mm -hmm. attention to mm -hmm. other than to just be kind of generally aware of it going on. And so, uh, honestly, and I've told people it was through your podcast that I learned what abide even was, mm. you know, I, I would see posts on Facebook and had no idea what it was, but I have a paper to write. So, yep. um, you know, and that's just, that was just my life. And, uh, so that, that third circle really got added. And by the time Synod came around June nine or whatever that was from May 16 to really a, a week or so before Synod, I listened to every single one of your podcasts, um, and just learned so much about what brought us as mm -hmm. a denomination to the point that we were finally getting to at Synod 2022. So I've appreciated, I'm new to appreciating all that's gone on in the denomination, even though I've been a part of it for, you know, since 09 when I first came here. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're part of the group that really spiked our stats right before Synod. We had, we were getting like crazy download numbers right before synod and i'm like i think we just have a lot of people all of a sudden finding us and then binging on all of our all of our episodes trying to catch up i had a number of people say that because they're like then i got caught up and now i gotta wait like a week every time exactly you, exactly the second half you gotta post more and i'm like i just don't have the bandwidth to post more than this this is <laughs> this is i'm still a full-time pastor <laughs> yeah. i am full-time podcaster yeah yeah but well, it's, it's, it's been good. I appreciate what you've done. Both of you. Yeah. Well, and, and this is one of the really beautiful things about the Christian Reformed Church. You know, some people kind of make fun of it and talk about the, how the Christian Reformed Church can be kind of inbred and and whatever. And there's there's a level of that, too. But but we're a small enough denomination where you can really know a lot of the people like it's not like you can, you can know the vast majority of kind of the, the people in the denomination. And so like I was, I've always kind of been an outsider in the denomination as well, but um, I went to Calvin seminary to try to just help myself get connected and kind of know what was going on in the Christian reformed church. But I still wasn't like super connected, but it was really easy for me to start this podcast, to start interviewing calling, you know, emailing people. And they're like, yeah, sure. I don't know. And so we can start <laughs> talking to people. And it's not like we've got a whole bunch of really famous pastors who, you know, like are afraid to, or whatever, who think they're too good. It's like, no, this is a bunch of average Joes. We're doing really good ministry where we're at. We're talking with each other and we can build these kind of relationships. And it's easy because we're not so massive, but we're not, we're not so teeny tiny either. We're kind of in this sweet spot. That's I think really good where we can still get a lot done because we've got this size, but also we can still have this fellowship where we really know each other. And I think, I think that's a, a beautiful thing that we have. Definitely. Yeah. Plus we agreed we were just going to make things up as we go along. Right, Jay? Sure. Yeah. We did decide <laughs> that too. <laughs> uh, Aaron, actually, I have a question for you about Synod. Um, okay. I, I met you far too late at Synod. It was, it was pretty deep yeah. in the week and I do regret that. Um, but I'm curious to know uh, your experience at Synod. Did you did you find that an encouraging experience, energizing? What was your impression? Yeah, I, I loved I loved everything about it. Honestly, um, it, it was part of adding 
uh, more depth to that third circle I'm talking about for me and my experience. And, and I don't just mean, I certainly do mean meeting a lot of the people that I'd heard interviewed on this podcast and just kind of putting faces with names and getting to know people. I, I, I didn't meet as many people as I would like to have, you know, but there was just so much going on. So I do mean that, but I don't just mean that because I met people that, you know, we would, we would fall on opposite sides of the current issues that we're dealing with in the denomination. And I met a lot of people that I think a lot of, right. And, and, yeah. and made friends, you know, across across the the board there. And also what I really appreciated about Synod was that it was a big part of adding that third circle to me, which I think makes me, uh, I think in ways it makes me a better minister in the CRC and to this church because I'm able to, I, I just have a broader scope of what's going on. And we've talked about that some in our council meetings and I'll try to you know, I just try to be aware of, of what's happening and they've, they've experienced that they really appreciate that. And before I just wasn't doing that, you know, and so it's helped me with that, but it's also just helped me have really more of an affinity for the CRC at that level, rather than just, you know, I love my church. I love my classes. I didn't really have that investment in the denomination, but I do now. And that was a part of, of Synod. So in many ways, Synod was energizing for me. It, it was physically exhausting. Mm -hmm. And Jason, I know you dealt with this too, what I'm about to say, because there most mornings we couldn't just get up and, and kind of relax at a breakfast or whatever, because we had either music rehearsal yep. or, or we had practice for the next days, you know, things. So those mornings I, I didn't quite get the, but it, it was good to be a part of the music at them, but I just felt like I was always going. So physically, I was a little bit drained when it was over, but just kind of mentally and spiritually, I found it energizing. That's all we have for this week. Stay tuned next week to hear part two of our conversation with Aaron Gonzalez. But until then, don't forget this is Christ Church, and he bought it with his blood. And we've been warned that wolves will come in trying to destroy the flock. So keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine. Preach the word in season and out of season. And keep fighting the good fight in this messy reformation.